Well, hello, greetings and salutations. Yes, it's another video from me. I can't believe it either, but I just got through watching this wonderful video by Alan Pope, and I figured I would do what Alan did. He has inspired me. His video was about his desktop, which I found very fascinating. Alan Pope works for Canonical. He is a software developer for Ubuntu, and he has been a part of the open source community for a very long time, and I have followed him in various ways and just really enjoyed the video. And he said that he got inspired by watching a video from Chris Ware where he was talking about his Linux Mint workflow. So Alan did that, and I'm going to do this. Now, I'm going to put a link in the description to Alan's video because I found it really cool the way he has his desktop laid out. And he does a lot of stuff with the GNOME desktop that I wouldn't do. But you guys might really enjoy looking at that. So you can check that out if you want to. Alan started out by doing a little history of his desktop experience, which I found actually very interesting because not only did um, I enjoy looking to see what he had done in the past, it was the fact that he actually kept screenshots of all this stuff which is something that I have done for years, and I have selected a few for you to look at. <laughs> uh, these are not in any particular order, and we're starting out in 2014. This would have been my old Dell Inspiron 570, which I had maxed out memory-wise. It had an Athlon 3 processor in it, AMD, and this was a machine that I bought new in 2000 and. 10, really early 2010, I believe. And I used it for a long time. It, it ran for over, well, let's see. It ran for about eight years, and then the power supply died. And those kind of Dells weren't really that, um, you, you couldn't do a whole lot to uh, make them, I couldn't, they weren't very upgradable is the point that I was trying to make. They were kind of consumer-based machines, and I had already pushed it to the edge, so I, I just let it go. But this would have been about a month or two before I switched over from using Windows 7 to using Ubuntu full-time. So this is a Windows 7 desktop, and I believe that this is VMware that I'm using for a virtualizer. And you're seeing Ubuntu GNOME. This was before Ubuntu switched back to the GNOME desktop. And then there is Linux Mint there in the middle and then in the back. It is Ubuntu 1404 with the Unity desktop. So that's where I was at just before the big crash. The hard drive in this machine died, and I just had to uh, make a decision what I was going to do, and I decided that I was not going to attempt to reinstall Windows 7, and I was going to use Linux. Now, I had been using Linux for quite some time in other machines and things. This was just my main machine. And after that, I went Windowless. Uh, Windows for Work Groups, version 311, uh, I don't know if that's a screenshot. It's something I found online, and I thought it was cool. Because I used to use that, and yes, I have been around that long. This is Windows version 1. It is a, a screenshot that I found uh, when they were experimenting with it. And it was kind of a tiling thing they had going. This is a bunch of terminals with me logged into all the machines on my network uh, through SSH. And at some point in time, I thought that was really cool. And I took a picture of it. This would have been from about 2012. It is me playing around with OpenSUSE. Let's see. No, they don't have a... There's no date there. So, yeah, this would have been me installing and upgrading OpenSUSE, playing around with it. So, yeah, about 2012. 13, I believe, in a virtual machine running on Windows 7. You can tell by that arrow desktop. This is the Cube. It is the Compiz Cube. This is Linux Mint, and it's a picture that I took for use on a very early incarnation of the Easy Linux web page. This picture goes way back. I think that this was about 2008 or so. And this is me running Ubuntu. This would have been like 8.10, I think. And the point here is, is that you'll see that there is uh, two browsers running, and they're both showing the same web page. The one in the back is Firefox of the day, and it's running Wikipedia. And then in front there is the Lynx browser, which is one of the original browsers ever, and it runs in a terminal, and people still use it today. And I found that fascinating at the time, and I think I 
took this picture for a post that I posted or article I wrote or something. I have no idea. But that's the picture. More virtual machines. I believe that's Ubuntu 16.04, so that would date the other two. That's Ubuntu Mate, and then there is Linux Mint. This is a fairly recent picture of a Linux Mint desktop with the uh, Mint Y Dark theme running. I think I tried it at the first of the year, not this year, but last year. Maybe I don't know. I did at some point recently and ran it for a little while. <clears throat> and you see that, yeah, it's a relatively recent version of Cinnamon. That's for sure. Uh, much older picture. This is, I'm I'm pretty sure that this is Manjaro running from uh, several years ago when I was playing around with that. Uh, this is a picture from about 2007 or 2008, and this is my XP desktop. And the picture uh, shows this dark theme. I believe it was called Royal Noir, and it was kind of this underground theme that you could get for Windows XP, and you kind of had to hack it into the system, and I liked it. And I had the little rubber froggy for my avatar. That was cool. I like little froggies. And then uh, this is Ubuntu, this would be Ubuntu maybe 9.10 or 9.04. And this was, I had just joined Facebook. I can tell you that much. It's a very early Facebook page. So, yeah. Lord, Lord. Or when was that from? Oh, wait a minute. Maybe this was when I was playing around with Ubuntu 18.04 and got it running. Yeah, this is a later picture that I took from a couple of years ago. It is a video that I put up. So this was my Facebook page at the time, but it wouldn't render properly. I just got it to open. So this is a live environment running in a virtual machine of that. This is uh, an Ubuntu desktop from when I could not tell you. Well, I know that it was Friday. That's about it. Ubuntu Mate, this is a pretty recent uh, screenshot because this is running on this machine. And then we have uh, another Ubuntu shot here. Ubuntu 1910, so that's fairly recent. That would have been right after I installed it. More Ubuntu. And another picture here, this time from 2000. And this is July 2014, the 25th. So, man, we're getting right up on top of that big hard drive crash right there. And once again, we're running Linux Mint, and we are running Ubuntu and Virtual Machines. This was a picture that I had put together for a very early incarnation of the Easy Linux webpage, in which I showed the Unity desktop next to the Cinnamon desktop. I don't remember exactly what this is, but I do know that it is Ubuntu running Unity with a virtual machine running Unity inside. This was... Ubuntu 14.04, and I was playing around with the concept of running the old XEyes application, which goes way, way back. It's kind of a fun application that is part of the X Windows environment, what we call X11 or just plain X these days. It's a very old application. It's still available, and it shows up in the corner there, and all it does is follow your mouse. And I wanted to see if I could get it running, and I did. And then um, there is the... Uh, man page for XIs. Linux Mint, this would have been 2015, something like that. Bunch of virtual machines running. Linux Lite, that's ex 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 definitely X Ubuntu or Zubuntu, whichever one you want to call it. I call it Zubuntu. Linux Mint there, and then once again, good old Ubuntu 1404. This is a virtual machine running within a virtual machine. Uh, somebody asked me if it was possible, and I gave it a try. And what I was able to do was install a 32-bit version of the uh, virtualizer within a 64-bit virtual machine and run a 32-bit version of Linux Lite. And it was extremely unstable if you would click on it, it, the whole thing would crash and it wouldn't work, but I did get it running long enough to be able to take that picture just as a proof of concept, because somebody said, can you do it? This is a little bit of a humor here, Windows protected your PC, um, <laughs> and I was running Linux. And then, uh, let's see, Windows 7 from 2011. 
So uh, this one is uh, just different themes running. Let's see. Uh, yeah, what we've got here is the arrow theme running on Windows 7 with a virtual machine running Windows XP behind it. And that's what it looked like. Another picture like that, this time from 2013. It's Linux Mint and Windows XP. And this would have been very shortly after I had set up my computer after moving to the house I live in now. For a long time, all of my computer stuff was in boxes. And we're talking like two or three months. And what happened was I was using just this one laptop with 1204 on it, this really low-end Acer laptop with Ubuntu 1204 to be able to do uh, really basic stuff. Like, I don't think I posted any videos, but it was just like answering emails and whatnot. That's what I was doing at the time. So this would have been right after I resurrected that machine. A picture of a player there playing stuff. Here's another desktop. This is Ubuntu Mate, obviously. And we're back around. So there's your history. Hope you guys enjoyed that. So what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about applications. First, let's talk a little bit about the machine. This is a Dell T5400. This particular series of machine goes back probably to about 2012, 2013. This is a later model. The, when I got the machine, the event log and the bias started in 2014. So that's how old this machine is. Yes, it is long in the tooth. It has two separate Xeon processors in it, non-multi-threading, so it's four cores per processor to give you eight, no multi-thread, and uh, these old t uh, precision work workstations are kind of like pedestal servers, so they have like a big server-grade motherboard in it with two processors on it, and this was a hot machine when it was new. I mean, it's got 32 gigabytes of ECC RAM, which is not great for gaming, but it's it's nice for virtual machines and other things. ECC RAM is parity RAM. It looks for mistakes. That's also called hardened RAM. So uh, that's what that is. It's a little slower than regular RAM. That's why it's not so great for gaming, but the idea is, is that you can have stuff sitting in memory for a very long time, and it will try and catch any errors and fix them. Uh, the machine currently has a Samsung Evo 960 hard drive in it. I think that's what it is, and I can tell you for sure because the box is like right over here, and it will tell me on the box. This is an 860, not a 960. Gee, I don't think they came out with a 960 yet, but anyway, I knew it was something like that. So that's what's in it, and um, that's it. It's big old honky machine called Big Boy. There was another Dell machine, the T4500, which was in the same series. That was actually a newer machine that died, and that was the original Big Boy, and I needed to replace it real fast, and I found this one on eBay. It served me well, but I really have to kind of just uh, look at buying a new machine now because it's starting to get a little slow. So since we're all Linux nerds here, the most important piece of software that we have on our machine is the uh, terminal, right? And this is my terminal. And there's nothing special about it. It's the standard GNOME terminal. That's all it is. The only thing that I do, to, I do customize it. I don't like the menu bar. I turn off the terminal bell. I do a few other little tweaks and I change the colors. Uh, the colors, people ask all the time, how did you get those colors in your terminal? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, so if I go to preferences and I go to this profile and I go to colors, what I do is, is I start out with the standard white on black and then I change the background to a custom color, which is this blue color here, which is inspired by the cobalt theme that you will find running in a lot of text editors. You can get that in gedit and it's in um, xed on Linux Mint and I think it's in Pluma as well. And I kind of figured out what that color was, and I came up with the number. It is a 111C34. So you go in where you add the... Uh, let me go back. I'll, show, I'll just show you. It's just easier to show. Let's go into colors, right? And I go into background here. Okay. And you see I've got that number in there. So it is uh, 111C34. And it'll give you that cobalt blue background. And that's it. I don't use Tmux. I don't use Terminator. 
I have looked at all those things. I've played around with tiling terminals and tabbed terminals and things like that. And the thing is for me is that I never can get used to it. So what I always end up doing is, is going control T and just opening a new terminal if I need a new terminal. You know, see, you can just keep opening. I'm very keyboard oriented and I love keyboard shortcuts. I like to close all these, it's alternate and F4. So one of the reasons that I like working with the GNOME desktop is that it is so keyboard based. That's another reason why I liked Unity years ago. And I really like the fact that Ubuntu, when they switched to Unity, brought a lot of those Unity features and those same keyboard shortcuts over because I had gotten used to it. So like I just I just like the way this works. I can do I don't have to touch a mouse to find a program, for instance. So for instance, like the next program I want to show you would be um, Let's see. Let's see if it'll find it here. Midnight Commander, right? So let's go ahead and click on that. And I will. Oh, that's the Midnight Commander editor thing. Jeez, I'll just get it in a terminal. Let's do MC here. That'll get it. Uh, Midnight Commander is a file manager that runs in a terminal. I can make this a little bigger. And I love Midnight Commander because it allows me to do search and destroy looking for files very quickly on all of the computers on my network so if I'm logging in through another machine through SSH I don't have to LS around and do a lot of listing and I don't have to wait for the file manager to open up through X forwarding so what I do is just use this terminal based one and it's so easy to navigate you just click around and then it's like, it's like if you want to go into cache you just do this you want to go back up you do that also this is mouse sensitive so look at this. I am using a terminal and using my mouse in the terminal. It is an awesome program. I did a uh, video about this some time ago. And to close it, F10 to quit. And there you go. It's gone. So that's uh, really the only modification I make terminal-wise. I, I don't add a whole lot of terminal applications. If I use a text editor in terminal, I use good old Nano. Uh, you guys you can have fun with VI. You can go right ahead. Um, no. <laughs> that one I never have been able to to use. So I'm just a, I'm a nano fan. And I use git in the terminal. I'm not going to show you that cuz it's a bunch of commands and who cares, right? So, uh let's see. We'll start up here. My browser of choice is Google Chrome. And I love using Google Chrome. I've been using it since it was in the early early beta stages. And uh it is my favorite browser. I do realize that it is a Google product. I know that Google is looking at everything that I type in here. I'm not terribly worried about it. And the reason why is because they already know everything about me because I do YouTube videos and I get paid royalties for ads that play in my videos through AdSense. To set that up, Google knows everything about me. They already have all of my pertinent information. So they're not gonna learn anything new. I'm not worried about that. And uh, well, as we go through here, do keep in mind that Linux is all about choice. If you choose to use something else, that's great. Uh, don't be nasty to me if I choose not to use what you use. Okay? And I'm not going to be nasty to you. I think you need to use whatever works best for you. So if you would like to use other browsers, you knock yourself out. I personally use Chrome because I find it to be a more stable experience. It is very good with using Google products and I use a lot of Google products and also it is compatible with just about everything out there and that's the point. It's I love their sync service as well. It's the best thing about Chrome. I have Chrome installed on all of my machines and then I can just go and sit down at that machine and it syncs up. It's, it's where I was. It's It knows what I was doing and I love that because I do tend to hop around machines a lot. So that's Google Chrome. And then we have Thunderbird, which is my mail client of choice. I could not live without Thunderbird, literally. I just, if Thunderbird went away tomorrow, I would be in a world of hurt because I am so invested in this. I have a lot of email. I mean, I know people that, there are people out there that have more to keep up with, but mine, it's very intense. So first of all, we have a Gmail account. And all of the notifications from YouTube come in from there. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but in your Gmail account, you can go into the settings, and Gmail will actually go and read uh, POP3 mail from other servers. 
So what you can do is, is like take your ISP and go into your POP3 account and it'll pull down all your email and throw it in the stream with your regular mail, but it will allow you to reply on the other one. You can set that up. I have that set up exactly to do that. So my Gmail actually pulls in my ISP email, which I never use, and then my Gmail account, and there's a lot of stuff that comes in there, obviously. Then we have the Easy Linux accounts that go with the Easy Linux page. And uh, those accounts are, uh, they're hosted, I don't host them myself, but it's pretty damn close. I have a hosting service that I use, and all it is is email, that's it. And I hate webmail, gang. I can't stand webmail. I can't use it. And then down here, this is the mail from the radio station here. Uh, this is the WZBB, and so they, the automation system actually spits out a lot of email here. It'll show you. Uh, it's like telling me that the schedule is available here, that sort of thing. So I love Thunderbird. It's my favorite mail client. I have tried others. At one point, I was using Geary an awful lot. And uh, Geary was kind of cool, but I really need the more sophisticated features of Thunderbird these days. I tried Evolution years ago. I kind of liked it. I used to like Evolution, and they changed it up a little bit. And I, I, I just can't get into it. I'm, I'm invested in Thunderbird. Uh, the file manager is Nautilus, which comes with the GNOME desktop, and I don't care much about that. People say that it has been eviscerated and a lot of different features have been removed over the years, and I, I completely agree, but I don't use those features, so it doesn't bother me too much. I've got a calculator here, and yes, I do put it in my favorites because I use it that much because I can't do any math in my head at all. Text editor of choice. The graphic text editor that I like the best is good old G-Edit. And uh, for a long time, when I was using Linux Mint, I used XED, and I like that too. That's based on Pluma. And then when I started using Ubuntu as my main thing, I started using gedit and just got real used to it. And I can put plugins in here, like uh, let's open up a script. So we'll open up. Um, well, that's not a script, is it? That's just something I wrote. Okay, so I have to go get a script, I see. I thought I had opened a script since I was on here, but no, we'll go find a script then. We'll go look at it, scripts. And we'll open up one of these here. So I like it because uh, I can add a plugin that lets me scroll the text size and make it bigger, number the pages. It will give me a margin at 80 characters, which is as far out as I wish to actually write scripts. And I also use this a lot of the time to process just plain text. So it has a spelling feature that I can turn on, but it's not on all the time. You have to go get it. Sometimes when you're working with scripts, you don't want to see spelling mistakes. So yeah, I like gedit. I like the way it's going. It's simple and it's got about the right amount of plugins for what I do. And I know some other people use some more advanced stuff, but I like to keep things simple. And LibreOffice Writer and LibreOffice Impress. So LibreOffice is my word processor of choice. It's pretty standard. I don't do anything to it. I do make sure that I have the entire suite of LibreOffice in there so I have all the features and all the doohickeys. Uh, an application that I use quite a lot for doing presentations for videos and I also use this to make thumbnails is the Impress program from LibreOffice. So those are the two that are most important. Now the funny thing about the Ubuntu desktop that they've done since they've switched over to GNOME, usually if you install LibreOffice there is kind of like an opening page that you can link to. You can have an icon that opens up a file and or well opens up the program but it opens up a program and it asks you what to do and it shows you your most recent applications and somehow or another the folks in Ubuntu have jacked around with LibreOffice to where you can't get that. So I use Impress and I use Writer most often, so I just put those up there. But I really like that thing where I can go to the, the database and the spreadsheet and everything in case I need to. Screenshot, I always have Screenshot in here, so I can take screenshots to share what I'm doing. Um, for editing pictures, I like Gthumb. And that's just showing what's in my little work directory there. And uh, it, it is uh, a very easy to use little picture editor. Um, 
don't like Shotwell. Shotwell is a non-destructive picture editor, which means that you make changes, but it doesn't actually ch save it to the original file unless you force it to. And for me, that's very confusing. Good old Gthumb, which has been part of the GNOME world for quite some time, when you save a file, it actually changes it. And that's just easier for me to deal with. Now, I got a whole buttload of audio software installed on this machine, but um, I did want to show you that uh, I use this program here. It is called uh, Ocean Audio, and it is a very simple wave editor, and you can use it to do some quick and dirty editing on things or recording audio, and I use that. Uh, I have the uh, good old Rhythm Box all jacked up with all my songs in it. I got a huge library that I collected over the years working in radio, and yes, I did get most of it legally. Uh, then we have a simple screen recorder, which is what we're using to record the video. Uh, Discs, which is an absolutely awesome application, and this allows you to do all kinds of storage-related stuff. Everything from formatting thumb drives to creating uh, ISO images of storage devices and restoring them. I actually use disks to burn, make bootable uh, USB sticks when I download an image because it's an ISO file and you just go to restore image and it puts it there. did a video about it years ago. I ought to revisit that and go back through that again because that is an awesome application and it's always been ready to rock and roll. I mean that's one I've used for years and years. Uh, so then we've got Boxes, which is the virtualization software I'm goofing around with these days. I have a really hard time getting virtualization to work on this machine. And I think it's because of the old Xeon processors and how it works. Like, for instance, um, I was testing Ubuntu 2004, the alpha, the daily build, and I installed VirtualBox. And it's just so painfully slow, no matter what the operating system is or the version of VirtualBox. I can't use it anymore. So I switched over to Boxes, which uses QEMU and KVM. That's a little bit more peppy, but it's still slow. I mean, especially with this thing having an SSD on it, but it's enough for what I do. And let's see, what else is that? That's just the picture viewer that's open and the terminal, which is in front of us. Uh, a couple more I want to talk about. I'll just go through here real quick. So audio-wise, I've got the Asunder CD Ripper. That's one I have to have. I've got Bracero because I actually do burn CDs for people these days, and they're audio CDs. I'm an audio head, so I burn things to play in my own equipment and stuff like that. And so I got that around. Um, another piece, I've got Time Shift installed, of course. That Time Shift is software to uh, uh, no that's not what I that's software and updates that's not what I meant to click on oh okay what did I click on I thought I clicked on time shift now yeah, Dow Louis George you were way off the mark time shift down here so it's that icon that messed with your head yes no, sorry this is time shift ladies and gentlemen um this is Time Shift, which is software that takes snapshots of the operating system and allows you to roll back to a known good state. This is very close to the Windows Restore function. Now, I know that there are people out there who attempt to use this as a full system backup, and they try and back up their home directories with it and all that other stuff on external media. It's not really good at that, gang. What I do is, is I use a combination of Time Shift to do those backups, those rolling backups, and, um, well, here, we'll just go through the wizard, and I'll just show you So uh, what, I, what my settings are. So I use the root partition there, and then I have it doing two dailies and, no, three dailies and two weeklies. And then I do not back up the home partition, which is in a separate partition anyway. Um, this software will get confused if it has to deal with a lot of different partitions. So it's good to keep it simple. Right now the only thing that it's trying to restore is the root OS partition. It's not trying to restore the home partition. And that's the way to use time shift. I mean you can do it however you want to. Now for the um, backup 
of my data, I use the BU script, which I've done many videos on. And you can go to easylinux.com and you can look at that video by looking at the Bash Scripts page there. Links are in the description to that page. And it will show you how the um, BU script works. So my local software, it goes in my bin directory here. And I can just uh, list that for you. And I, I will talk a little bit about SL. No, you're going to do LS. Make sure you get it right. You can't type and talk. So these are the little tools that I have uh, ready to rock and roll. We've, I've got videos up about all of this. Up, sync all. These are little things that I have used. And um, this is what I use to be able to back up the system and restore it very quickly is the... Um, the BU program and um, and of course up is an update program and those videos are on the web page plus look at the easy Linux page and look under bash scripts it's all there in one place or another and it's all on github as well so that is basically it oh there's one more application that I did want to talk about because I do have so much music on the machine it is um, an application called mp3 gain it has been around for a very long time I used it when it was on Windows, so that shows you how old it is. And it's um, now I use it from a terminal. It's a very simple application, and what it does is it goes through MP3 files, and it finds an average level for all of those files so that they sound like they're the same volume. And if you have a very large collection of music, it is uh, really useful. And the the thing that makes it especially useful is this is not a replay gain that is being set in a player. This is actually modifying the file frame by frame for this volume. You can go back to the original volume. You there's a way to do it. You can you can restore it. But what it will do is is it will find an even level so that when you're playing music, uh, everything comes up and nothing's jumping out at you, being real loud or too quiet and stuff like that and it's a great piece of software read the manual carefully if you intend to use it this is maintained these days by Martin Wimpress and if you do a search for Martin Wimpress audio stuff yes this is the same Martin Wimpress who is the head of the Ubuntu Mate uh, flavor of Linux he's also the head of the desktop division for canonical right now hell he's developing mainstream Ubuntu well he maintains that and it's very useful and thank you Martin for doing that I do appreciate it as far as the desktop itself is concerned man I used to theme stuff up a long time ago and used to be really into that sort of thing I don't anymore I do a few little tweaks like I have tweaked this is Ubuntu 1804 and I'm just running the good old ambience theme I did do a few tweaks so it would work a little bit better with um, go ahead and close that because it keeps getting in my way every time I open up the file manager it's happened happened in the last take of this before I stop anyway uh, I like this theme it's the old Ubuntu theme good old ambience I like Yaru too the new theme it's fine I got no problem with it if they're legible <laughs> I do it now for a while there I got really into dark themes but then that crashes a lot with browsers and things like that so I gave up on it and I found that the dark themes, even though it was easier for me to see initially, caused me more eye strain. Now I don't know why that is, but it's true. And I would get I was getting headaches and stuff, so I had to switch away from dark themes. And now I like these kind of in the middle of the road themes. I don't like real light themes, but I like these middle of the road themes, so this is what I do. Um, in the install script that I use for Ubuntu 1804. I do add uh, Qt5 plugins and uh, set an environment variable that makes all the Qt display in the ambience theme as well because uh, the way Ubuntu 1804 was issued it's like every Qt application just came up in whatever that I can't remember it's it's escaping me now but it's the name of like the default Qt theme and um uh, I, do, I don't like it so that's the only thing I do later versions like in uh, 1910 and 2004 for Ubuntu you don't have to worry about that Yaru it displays on all QT and everything they've kind of worked that out it's much better or at least it appears to be I haven't tried it with every QT application on the planet but there you go 
And finally, before I wrap up the video, we'll talk a little bit about the screen capturing software. This is it right here, Simple Screen Recorder uh, by um, Martin Baert. He's the fellow who, who uh, develops this, and it is this has made my YouTube channel happen. Thank you, Martin. I appreciate it. This is what I use to make these videos, gang. It is a very simple application. For a long time, it was available in Ubuntu from a PPA, and now it's in the repositories. It wasn't available on Debian forever, and I think they've put it in the repositories as well. It's always been available on Arch and Manjaro because it was in the repos, but you can always get it out of the AUR, so it's on just about every distribution these days, and I do love it uh, for a screen capturing soft piece of software. Just a USB microphone, and you're in business. That's it. And the way I have this set up is the video is um, just in a it's it's like a, a Matroska container, so it's MKV, and the audio is FLAC. So it's un it's it's FLAC file. It's a it's using FLAC for the streaming audio, and I think it makes a difference to use a lossless format on YouTube. So that's how I got it set up, and it's 30 frames per second. And um, unfortunately, with this machine and the video card that I have, I have noticed that there is a little bit of screen tearing in the video. I'm not seeing any screen tearing because of my compositing setting, but I bet you are. And that's that's the only downside here. But for a lot of videos that I do, eh, it don't matter. I'm not trying to get motion going. So let me see. I need to do the feedback slide, don't I? Because we're done. I hope you enjoyed the tour, gang. And uh, that is um, what I am using these days. And in the last... Uh, I had 1910 running, then I went back to 1804, I tried 2004 for a little while, and then I rolled back to um, Ubuntu uh, 1804 this morning. I have all this stuff backed up and imaged and in such a way that all I got to do is reinstall the OS and then run the install scripts and boom, I'm back to it. So I can jump around within reason. I can jump from different versions of Ubuntu with no issues. If I'm going to something like Linux Mint or a different desktop, that's a different procedure. Anyway, your feedback is always welcome. You can check out Easy Linux on the web. It's uh, easylinux.com. That's where all the scripts are that I was talking about. You can also check out uh, Easy Linux on Facebook if you are a Facebook user and give it a like if you would appreciate it. And check out Easy Talk. That is our forum that we run ourselves. That is self-hosted, by the way. We're, we're doing that ourselves. That's not through some big corporation that could change it or take it away from us. So your information is very secure. And we do have some great moderators that help to keep things nice and uh, friendly, if you know what I mean. So check that out as well. Hope you enjoyed the vid. Thanks for watching. Talk to you again soon.